that because that's actually the first thing in the list, and that was the, you, you know, Jews are Republican. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell them when you're recording and we can just start. I, I just started. <laughs> right, okay. By the way, not one of us here is a Republican. We were in the middle of a conversation. <laughs> now, under my state that I own it, the, the primary was a Republican. Republican. <laughs> <laughs> That's Go ahead, Doug. He was saying he was a registered Republican. <laughs> yeah, when I first started voting, then I was like, I don't want to be affiliated with anybody. <laughs> right. Now, here's the thing, okay, so that we did, we're discussing independent mm-hmm. Now, some states will let you remain independent and participate in primaries. But here's the thing that I say. Declaring yourself a Republican or Democrat because you may disagree, may, let's say you agree with somebody, one party 60% uh, and the other party 40%. You clearly are within delineation more so on one side than the other. And we can counter that by saying there's other countries like France that have a tremendous amount of political parties and you essentially vote the party in then votes their candidate in. My wife, Guatemalan, is very much that you vote the party, then that votes the candidate uh, in. And that, and that candidate can actually pre- can change on a whim. It's just the party that you participate in. And what I'm saying is that it's very dangerous to, p- to play an independent game when it comes to the literal aspect and function of this country. On principle, it's, it's well okay to say you're independent, but do not carry that into a little, the literal function of the way this politics works in this country. The grass is not greener on the other side, no matter if we have multiple parties or just two parties. But the way things are in the United States, if we practice literally the function of maintaining independence from either party, we destroy our own message and what we want to convey at the national level. Meaning, the most important process in the United States, politically, is to participate in a primary process. Because the most, the most of what the press or anybody on opposite sides, if they were to reverse each other in debate, would call extreme, exists within the primary process. We must be more interested in participating in the primary process more so than the national level, because the primary process explores ideas far more than the national level can. Because once you're national, and both parties have pushed their candidates there, it's pretty much game over at that set. You've made a finite set of rules to which... Yeah, do you want... Do you want... Do you want yeah. Dork 1 or Dork 2? <laughs> right. Like, Let's become the lesser of two evils. The po- which is a negative voting situation. The positive voting situation exists in the primaries. That's where you have tons of candidates, tons of choices. Now, it may, it may, it may just be that you have seven candidates up there that all say the same thing you're not attracted to. Well, if that's the case, chances are there's going to be, I mean, look, you've got, I think, a plethora of ideas and invocation points within the Republican primaries, that if, it, if you were even a 52% agreement with the Republican side of things, that you would probably find a candidate within the current swath of candidates that would probably make you happy on some aspects. Well, and you see, that, that's honestly that what... It's clear in the primary process. That's one of the things I wish... Um, that... It's one of the few things I don't like about the U.S. education, it's me, um, elector, uh, election system. I almost wish that rather than having the primaries, just all the candidates would were in the national and we'd leave it up to the... Disaster. We can't do that. See, here, that's the thing, that's like I said. The grass is not greener on the other side. I, I, I know. But it, it's, it's the reason why I have electoral colleges here. And, 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 I, and let me say this. I speak from experience. I've ridden I have been a part of the Electoral College for the state of Texas. So I know I know how the function is. And let me tell you that your vote counts. I, I cannot be any clearer than that. 
you may think your vote counts. It's because you know what happens when people say they don't vote counts? It's because they don't do anything until the national election when there's two guys. And then they vote and they're like, oh, well, what does it matter? Your vote counts. I, I have lived at the smallest precinct level to the county levels to the state levels of how the electoral process functions in the state of Texas. And I can tell you, votes matter. Believe me, I stayed up till three in the morning counting votes. It was you! You did it! <laughs> I have stayed up till three in the morning counting votes. Votes, your vote matters. And your most specific ideology for what you believe in politically matters most in participating in the primary process. Period. That, it, 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 there is no, I, I, I am very, I, I like the United States political system. Uh, because I, I won't just tell everybody, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're disappointed because you don't do a damn thing until you get to the national level. No, no, no. Yeah. That, 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 that to me is the biggest problem with the United States system. It's not the system itself. It's that Everybody has the right to participate. They choose not to. They choose not to get informed. They choose not to get educated. And then they sit back, they argue about the result, and they say, it's their fault, they did it! There, I've got my bit! <laughs> <It's like laughs> say it again, say it again, Bob. <laughs> I said, it, you know, that's my, okay. I mean, if I had to choose on which side I lean, it, I definitely lean more to the conservative Republican side. Uh, I, I, I will be honest. Some of the aspects about the conservative Republican side scare the bejesus out of me. I said but, some. But, but, but so too do some of the aspects about the liberal <laughs> Democrat side. <laughs> you have the Peter Tree huggers who scare the hell out of me. Then you have to anyone who's religious, I'm sorry. Um, you have the Bible-toting, you know, Westboro Baptist Church people. Look, look, look I, 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 I do genuinely know that most Christians do not want to burn you at the stake, but when Bible thumpers start standing up, I am literally in fear for my life. I, I am afraid that I am going to be put on the fire or something. It's like they, they, they do make me afraid. What I mean is those are the two extremes that on either side scare the hell out of me. Yeah. It, 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 it's the, it's got one nut job on one side and another nut job on the other side. And there's who are crazy middle. for entirely different reasons. <laughs> exactly. Well, and, you know, Go ahead. Finish y'all's thought. Yeah, we finished it. Go ahead. I think there's a delay, and I hate talking over you. Yeah, I know. Go ahead. We're we're finished, Marcel. (laughs) We've dug our own graves. We will now be be tortured for being the wrong religion. (laughs) So, um, the thing is this. I do also have a problem with the extreme religious on the right. Very much so. But the thing of it is, is that they're not the majority. They just sell the most advertisements. And therefore, the, they get the most press because, of course, that gets the viewership. We, it's just quite, quite simply comes down to that. Um, and also on the on the left, where you have like the Occupy Wall, this Wall Street movement, which they don't even know what their own message is, but um, they, no, I, they I, 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 we'll get into their message in a minute. But yes. they, they get press because it sells. Now, my thing of it is, is that. My priority is economics, first and foremost, because essentially anything within, within, you want to call it an empire, a country, or what, or whatnot, the function of economics is its foremost priority. And if you do not have that right, nothing else matters. Your morals can be in disarray. Anything else can be in disarray. But if you do not have a function of established property in exchange. Nothing functions. You are in and up. So, the way I delineate politics is who has the most viable economic policy first. Right? Of course, that gets dampened, damp- dampened by the social aspects of which 
a lot of the the rights social aspects I'm not on board with. For instance, like the whole uh, there's a lot of anti-gay, which I'm not. There's um, There's still very much this. I don't want to say the context of what which they argue, like pro life is too much for me. That there's no exceptions. I'm I'm more of a, log, a logistic a logistics on it than that. On that, it's not my business. If present, uh, let me put a caveat because I think we we said before. I do not support abortion for a means of a contraceptive. I can't, that to me crushes me under uh, the problem with that issue in a nutshell uh, uh, is, is you're trying to legislate something that has no absolutes and yeah, like you're I, saying yeah. you, 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 at the end of the day where that real issue comes down to part of it is a theological debate about the morality yeah. of the issue and the other part of it is like what you're talking about the abuse of even if you have the right and the problem with that is you're trying to legislate intent which is impossible Exactly. And it's kind of like, isn't it Ron Paul's position that it shouldn't be the government's place to deal with it and legislate it, and that's the court system's place? I mean, uh, the, my personal opinion is that if you use abortion as a means of a contraceptive and economics was your excuse to, you know, uh, uh, let me think about this. If, you, if the reason to abort is anything other than your own that your own health is at risk, I disagree. Like, if your health is at risk or if you've been raped, uh, then it's your choice, in my opinion. Um, but if it's like, oh, I can't afford it, or uh, I, I, it, who doesn't know how to use protective sex, no, my, I can't. I, my personal opinion on that particular argument is I have the wrong genitalia to have an opinion unless... It's exactly. my, unless it's my blood in there, in which case I reserve the right to reverse that position and have a vote. <laughs> sure. But I just can't, I, I've seen women brag about getting abortions. Oh, there are some who do it just because they only want <laughs> boys or only want girls. I mean, it's, I'm, there, there's... It's just... I can't, if your life is at risk, and I'll, I will take the professional opinion of doctors that say your life is at risk to abort the baby fine. And if you've been raped, by, you will certainly have a choice on it because your property has been violated. Well, okay, but to play devil's advocate on that, what about all the people who are walking around today that are the result of, you know, rape? Rates. I understand, but yeah. I cannot intervene. <laughs> intervene. It goes, against, it goes against my grind, I guess you could say, is that is that I the fetus is a life at conception. But we also have laws on the books that do we not, because I am also for the death penalty, for consequences of property, we do put people to death as well. Now, I understand that, that the fetus could be argued did not commit a crime, but we have a serious crime that took place that violated to, to things that you and I could never imagine have taken place. I mean, it's one of the most serious breaches of, of, of property uh, and the person, our identity, what they are, that, that it, it cannot even be legislated or should in that aspect that would take away that woman's choice to do what they to what they, to do. Now, if they decide, I have problems though, I will say, in my opinion, with waiting until the last minute to abort. I really take issue that you had all these months and all of a sudden we're, we're at month seven you want to abort. It's like, I, 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 I have serious issues um, with legitimizing any argument at that level, other than if, the, if the her life is in danger. Um, that's just my opinion on, on things. But 
when I, and, but that position is not favored by pro-life people. Pro-life people are, it's life above all else, well, you know, at the end of the day, the argument comes down to, uh, if you want to break it down to its most basic, like I said, there's the morality argument, which is the one you're trying to have, but that, that argument gets really, really icky really quick. And then there's the theological one of, from the moment of conception, the sperm is sacred, and there's a soul in there, damn it. And it's... Do, you, do you know the Jewish perspective? You know what the Jewish perspective is? Is that you have a right to abort? That the baby is subservient to the mother? The mother's life comes first in Jewish law. Up until the cranium of the skull is, I can't remember the exact measurement, but the baby's life is subservient to the mother's authority until the baby's cranium is a certain amount of inches outside. So basically, a 10th month abortion would be ethical under yep. the official it Jewish be. theological belief. <laughs> that can't, no, labor hasn't started yet, and abortion's okay. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> I, I mean, let me, let me put it this way. There would be some serious judgment. I mean, religiously, Jewishly, there would be some serious judgments on, okay, wait a minute, what is the reason... Oh, I'm sure you'd have to convince the rabbi and the elders and everybody else. <laughs> you know, all, that, all Jewish law is saying is, the, is, is that the mother's life comes first, which means that the context is if the mother's life is in jeopardy, the baby must be aborted. It's not that, oh, you can legally abort just for whatever fucking reason. Well, no, it's the, like I said, at the end of the day, and part of what makes that such a heated issue is it is fundamentally why there's the ethical concern and we always have the ethical argument at the end of the day it's one of those arguments that is a theological argument and different theologies have different core beliefs on that particular on what is and isn't uh, and that is ultimately I have yet to come across a single individual that their rudimentary point of view on that isn't very much an augmentation, if not necessarily 100% in line, with their core philosophical theological philosophy. It's just, it's, you know, it, it, like it or not, that is in doctrine to many people's ethical center. And the fact that we have such a diversity of that, which I do not consider a bad thing at all, I consider it a great thing, sure. is also why issues like this get so heated, because the absolutes of right and wrong get a little fuzzy when you have more than one rule book. <laughs> hey, can I just stop? Can I just stop real quick? Uh, I yeah, just saw this article. Okay. Apple's, Apple sales top 100 billion but fall short of estimates? Is that yeah, right? that was in the thing, but we didn't go into it. I was going to go into that in uh, iWorld. Alright, and we'll do that in iWorld. Alright, but, um, okay, so... It, yeah, abortion is an extremely... I don't have all the right answers for it, but I can I can certainly tell you that pro-choice versus pro-life is a wrong approach to this delicate subject. Well, uh, and, and that's in line with part of the reason why we're doing this, you know, impromptu sign. Basically, the point of this, we didn't say this before we got going, but basically... We're just going to bring up all the political bullshit. We're going to dump it all out in the open and try and look at, okay, this is the debate we're having. This right. is the debate we should be having. This is what right. the debate is actually about. You know, let's not fall for all the... Because the reality is, this year in the United States, the election That's is... an important election. It's an important election, and it is going to be 360 days of mudslinging, sliding, and bullcrap. And something everybody needs to keep on their run is participating in the process and keeping their eye on what the issues actually are, not where the mudslinging is trying to steer them. <laughs> right. And, and, and I did, we did digress a little bit, but um, the, the, the thing I'm getting at is that we were trying to find the delineations of being part of a party. Where where do I differ from a political party? Um, uh, and, and I could say I'm a, on some social issues. I, I am stringently against the Republican Party. Um, and, and, but although economically, I'm very much in their 
shades of gray uh, camp. And, I, and we digress socially within, within abortion. But I really would love to get um, into this debate thing with, with um, Rick Perry, who I like. I mean, he's been my governor for, good God, a uh, decade plus, and I can vouch for uh, how things function in this state, and, 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 it, and go, it speaks to why I support them. Um, and also, his immigration point of view is it not any different than Ronald Reagan's, who did get amnesty, and yet the Republican Party idolizes Ronald Reagan, but seems to whitewash his amnesty program that he did get. My father-in-law is in this country because of Ronald Reagan. Well, if we're going to, okay, let, let's let's go ahead and jump into that issue, which is actually but, down but, on but the list. I, I want to play this, I want to play it, because this, I, I didn't get to see this, and I, I want to, this, this is a, a debate between Mitt Romney and Rick Perry. I'm Congressman Ron Paul from West Texas, I'm the champion of the debate. I am the only one that has offered a balance. I'm on CNN, and they, this is a video they've shown. Oh my, President Obama. I'm glad to be in Las Vegas. It's a great place to have a convention. Well, I love you, brother, but let me tell you something. You don't have to have a big analysis to figure this thing out. Go to New Hampshire where they don't have a sales tax, and you're fixing to give them one. This is an example. Okay, there you go. Let me stop there. Rick Perry is so right. Now, Texas has a sales tax, Rick Perry. So, um, he knows it, but there, my parents come from New Hampshire. It is so true that Herman Cain's plan that people don't realize he is adding another tax bracket. Even though he may say, I'm lowering the margins on others, let's say capital gains, I will tell you right now, I don't believe in taxing corporations. <gasps> How dare you say that? Why don't I believe in taxing corporations? It's because a tax on a corporation ends up going to the employees and the consumer anyway. So, if you're going to increase the cost by a taxation on a corporation, which is a legally a separate entity than individual, I will give you that, if the cost of increase is passed to the employees and then to the consumer. Well, but at okay. that point, the corporation has a control and the discrimination of how it's dispersed. Well, but what you're getting at is a growing trend in the United States, and that's actually why the first issue I'd put in here was tax and debt. Because at the end of the day, we're having, the debate we're having when it comes to tax and debt in the United States right now is, like you said, the Occupy Wall Street and stuff like that. It's, those evil rich SOBs didn't work for it. We're entitled to it. Take it from them. Give it to us, those evil corporations and rich SOBs that don't work, they're who's responsible. Take it from them, they're responsible. Okay, now the argument that's made behind that is fair share. You know, they have to pay their fair share. You know, that's, uh, you know, that's, um, you know, and that comes into a lot of things. I, okay, there, the reality is there are rich people who didn't work for it. Th those exist. They're, very rare. Yeah. Very uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're, they're, they're more exceptions to the rule. And, and I have news for you. Most people... What's wrong with being rich, though? Uh, no, uh, th that, that's the thing I'm trying I to figure out. I'm rich, but I don't, I don't have this animosity. Good for them. I, I'm trying to figure out when that changed. Once upon a time in the United States, the poorest of the poor, you know, drove their kids down the street of the richest of the rich and said, if you work for it, you too can have this. That was what we taught. That, that was like, it's like, if you want it, and you want to go get it, you can have it. But that's not what we teach anymore. What we teach now is, they took it from you. Go take it back. And I don't know when that happened, and I don't know why that happened. It's like, it's like you said, the prerequisite is, there's something wrong with being rich. If you're rich, you've done something wrong. It's like, you, you, and I'm like, um, I'm not sure I agree with the, with the prerequisite of the solution. That's like, and, and the question I try and have... It's a false premise to build. Right? Well, well, but I try, uh, but the, okay, but I try, and, I try and go through the premise and its logic and have the debate. It's like, okay, they have too much. How much is too much? And then they'll, you know, 
usually you can get an answer out of that. Usually it's something like, well, if they have more than 200K, I can't imagine anyone have, needing exactly. to spend more than 200K. Okay, okay. And I'm like, okay, how much did your house cost? Oh, that's wait, wait, different. Wait, 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 you stop, but you can, you can stop them right there. Because <laughs> once somebody makes a line in the sand, you become central planning. That means an arbitrary party dictates what is rich and what is not. Which means at any point given in time of life, they have on principle given authority to some higher power, which may not have to do with money, but with the way that they govern their lives, dictate to them that you cannot do this, you cannot do this, you cannot do this. And, and, and they've given up. Because for some reason, many people like Occupy Wall Street can make delineations in central planning when it comes to money. But when it comes to their social interactivity, you cannot touch it. But yet, it's because they do not yet understand themselves of what property is as themselves as an individual and in that we have money as a barter system because resources are scarce. You know, the reason why Star Trek, the Federation doesn't have money, even though the Star Trek universe contradicted itself, uh, and, 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 oh, yeah, you, you, you can move on to the point before we go. What I want to say is that the reason those utopias exist, what is this thing that, like, well, I mean, i got to use Star Trek because it's probably one of the most well-known, the where they don't, uh, stories, of course, being fictional, uh, is that they've overcome that which defines economics. In Star Trek, you can fabricate food from replicated, what they call replicators. What have they essentially done in that in that science fiction show? They have eliminated scarce resources. And therefore, if you, if, if you eliminate limitation of logistics, it's not just the resource, okay? The resource may be limited, but also the logistics and the way people consume it. All of that is a limitation of economics and why economics exists. If you eradicate those reasons, you no longer need economics. Resources are infinite. The way you distribute those resources are infinite. And the way consumers consume them has no limitation. Well, no, it's a, I, I, I agree with that, but we don't live in that world. We, we live in a world where there there is so much. And, so, and, and the thing that annoys me the most... Wait, 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 yeah, let me finish my point. Okay. That is why I argue against anybody who talks about equal outcome or communism or socialism. Those are not economic models. They contradict themselves because you have not accepted the premise of limited resource, limited logistics, and even, uh, we don't even use the word limited, unequal resource, unequal logistics, and unequal consumption. It is a true statement that we do not equally consume. Well, but see, that's not the that that's not the way the position of the evil rich thinks about it. The way the position of the evil rich thinks about it is they have it, I don't. They focus on statistics that make that position strong, like uh, the the rich have this much much more than the poorest of the poor, I ignoring for a fact that if you have rich, you're going to have poor. And if there's an order of magnitude difference, you're going to have... I mean, I'm sorry. One of the things you will never get rid of in the United States, as long as it's an upward mobile society, where you have the ability to move from the poorest to the poor to the richest to the rich, is there will always be an uneven distribution of wealth, and it will always be lopsided towards the rich side. No, as, as, not true. Not true. Not true. Actually, the thing that is is that you actually were hitting on... on uh, you had everything right up, up until that point. What you are getting at is income disparity, which with the myth, it's a myth. Rich are getting rich from the poor getting poor. Not true. Think no, 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 no. What they focus on there is not the income disparity, but they present it as the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poor. What right. it, when you when you look at the but numbers? You just see that, that the rich have an advantage. That's not true. The rich don't have an advantage. The rich actually have more to lose. Let's put it this way: the rich. Getting rich and the poor coming, coming poor comes from a statistic where you can take an analysis of income distribution from one year and then take it from another year. Yes. And then compare them. And then all of a sudden say, oh, look at the numbers and look what happened. That doesn't, the, and the answer you're trying to get from those two statistics comparison actually doesn't tell you that answer. It's just 
reported that way. Exactly. So they're a false argument. Incomparability, of which even the Republicans just fucking screwed up too, is, is, is how we trace what is happening with the rich and the poor. And what we have seen is that the poor from year A that was measured are no longer poor in year B. And the rich, many of them that were in year A, are no longer rich in year B. Which means we have a transition of people becoming rich and actually losing fortunes, going uh -huh. back to poor, to becoming rich again. And what people even don't even understand is that take our models in this country, compare them to others, and look at the income mobility of this country. If it says anything to any socialist that's watching, it says the power of opportunity and why we argue opportunity. Hey, well, and that's why I'm bringing that no, up. No, 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 don't stop me. Because that. Because the, the people that are poor in year here and that are no longer poor here, that the rich that were here are no longer rich here, speaks volumes of the opportunity for one individual to become poor and then also become rich again at an accelerated pace versus any other country in the world. We have so much opportunities here that the scale in which we should measure is that the poor in year A are not the same poor in year B. And then rich in year A are not the same rich in year B. It speaks volumes of the economic opportunity available in this country that we can move and change on a dime and create fortunes and lose it all like that. Well, and, th and that's what I was trying to get at and get at because the way they present those statistics is like you're saying, Oh, these poor, poor people. We have to say them. I'm like, no, no, no. And, and, and what, what pisses me the hell off is of all the countries... Okay, I'm going to... This is... The, you know, there's no good way to say this. Of all the countries they want to compare the United States of America to, and, and that kind of shows the flaw in, in lopping the statistics like this. They want to go, in China, this disparity is not this bad. Well, that's because China is not as upward of mobility. So as a matter of fact, a lot of the peasants are going to die peasants. They, they're they not going to... Yeah, you know how many uprisings take place in China? Oh, I, I know, but, see, but that's why the statistics present that way out of China. Because you don't have... for uh, uh, there, there are areas of China where you have that. But for the most part, you're in the well, peg hole. Right, right there, just temporarily, is that... China doesn't give us authentic statistics. 1997, 2003 are both economic points in history where countries gave us a fictional set of books versus the real books. Go ahead and continue. And that's what they base that on also. If you look at the more extrapolated books where people have tried to piece together an actual you know, study of China, which is an incredibly difficult thing to do, like you're saying, that's... <laughs> Uh, you know, one of my good friends was my professor in economics. Uh, um, basically, was a VP at Bank of America and was hired to go and do a curial accounting reports on China and was asked to leave the country. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> That's the thing. But I mean, at the end of the day, you're never going to get the statistics you want to to have the argument on that way, unless. A, you get rid of the upward mobility in the United States, and B, you basically pigeonhole people. Basically, the system you want to create to make that argument is the exact opposite of what we have. You want a forced downward mobility system, um, which is not the United States of America. Anybody in the United States of America wants to live in. It sounds good arguing those statistics, but the reality of it is uh, and that's the argument I keep trying to have with these people. Um, okay, if you're one of these people that genuinely believes the evil rich, it's the evil rich, you need to, A, take a step back for a minute and sign. Because when you ask, you need to answer these questions for yourself. If you think they don't pay enough, how much do you want them to pay? Don't Be even entertain that. Because you've already accepted the premise. I don't even, I don't even get to that point. Because you're not arguing economics. If you you are arguing emotion, you can't even go to that level. No, 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 no. I, 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 I would argue if they would actually go through and do the math on that. No, you can't do that. Because you're not arguing. 
you are trying to give a quantitative scientific method to something that is not scientific. Well, no, no, no. But it can If you do that, Marcel, it becomes scientific. Because no, no, no. no. Okay, I let I let you finish yours. Let me finish mine, and then right. tell me why it's wrong. Okay, um, because at the end of the day, their logic is they don't pay their fair share. They have all the money. They have everything else. In the United States, we have all these great statistics on this stuff. We actually know with a reasonable degree of certainty distributions of things, how things are broken up, yada yada. We know what the national debt is. We know how much the government tends to spend. We have all of these numbers. So ask them, what do you consider a fair tax on these evil rich SOBs? And then have them apply their magic number, whatever it is, towards balance towards actually paying for what the government spends and everything else and what percentage of the wealth these people are and everything else. Because when you start going through the math there, not only do you realize it doesn't add up, but we take everything they have, we still don't balance the budget, which means then we have to come after the new rich, the upper middle class, we take everything, and it, then they start to see the forced downward Mobility. I'm not now. I need to point out something. I don't know where you stand on this. I am not diametrically opposed to raising the the argument that keeps getting lost here in all of this is like we need to raise taxes on the rich. We need to raise taxes. And if you start arguing against the evil rich and doing that just all willy nilly, then it's for oh you hate raising taxes. Son. I'm actually all for raising taxes in the United States right now. But I have a prerequisite on that. My prerequisite on that is. Our resources as the American people are not limitless. And until I have some kind of pledge from my government that my taxation is not going to just be to more taxation next year and more taxation the next year and more taxation the next year until they take everything I have, I'm disinclined to give them a larger charge account. I understand there's a shitload that has to be paid for. And the reality is the only way to pay for that is to make the make things balance out but if we give them more money they'll just spend more as things stand right now and that's that's okay. the debate we need to be having <laughs> okay well, well go ahead and can you pause real quick i gotta go uh and i'll be right back okay <laughs>